creative practice as a poet exists in a mutually generative relationship with my research, where poetry and more traditional methods of research create questions and sometimes find answers for each other. Um, human impact on the environment is at the forefront of public discourse for obvious reasons, um, and the role and the rights of eco-poetry in relation to this impact are much contested, as Maria Parkin spoke about. Um, my work in engaging with 19th century texts doesn't make any claims as yet to direct ecological activism, but its ways of looking are influenced by the era in which environmentalism arguably has its roots, while in its attention to real trees, both as individuals and as the subjects of poetic legacies, it's also shaped by post-human perspectives. My interest in marginalized poetic speakers also entails a problematized reclamation of the lyric I in nature poetry for myself as a queer working class woman of color. These approaches have led to experiments in what I'm calling humble anthropocentrism, in which through metaphor, marginalized speakers align themselves with nature, often in opposition to forces which would oppress both, um, and in poetical grafting, uh, more of which later. Um, so the first poem I'll read uh, illustrates the ways in which my work interacts with its 19th century source texts as problematic predecessors using a very well-known poem to English school children, Wordsworth's I Wandered Lonely as a Cloud as its inspiration. Um, so uh, that's just in case you don't know this poem. <laughs> uh, I wrote this uh, poem after my brother got COVID and it cancelled a trip to the Lake District that I was supposed to take to visit Wordsworth's uh, yew trees and his house and stuff. Um, and I was sitting in St. James's Park and noticed that all the daffodils around me were dead or apparently dead. Um, and in a kind of miserable, self-indulgent metaphor hunting, I was like, just typical. Now they're all dead and shriveled, just like my hopes of going on this trip. Um, so, <laughs> so then I started to think more carefully about it and I looked up the phrase daffodil death, just another one of my many odd Google searches um, and uh, I discovered that daffodils are one of the few flowers that don't need to be deadheaded that is when the flower wilts it's best to leave it on because uh, daffodils kind of uh, store up all their energy and it, it helps them to flower more vigorously the following year um, so thinking about those daffodils and my cancelled lake district trip I obviously thought about Wordsworth and his lovely time with his lovely daffodils. Um, and I thought about the ways my daffodil interaction was so different from his. Mine were these shriveled urban plants past their best, past their blooming, and they were devalued because of the way that they look, but secretly gathering power underground, which I thought was a pretty nice metaphor for marginalized poets generally. So this poem is called Cloud Busting. Not so sprightly, these. Flowers, shriveled, scrotal, aren't heads. And it's only the flowers are dead. The daffodils, still live, are biding time or brawn for next year's bloom, abiding by me, littering the ground with treads. Me, all unwilling, crushing pin-bright ants, deflowering daisy beds. And if I had a heart that danced, you wouldn't dance with me any road beside the lake, beneath the trees. No spot in this city bright enough to turn to bliss this changing. Now, I know what you're thinking. Uh, starting with a poem inspired by one of the major white dudes of the canon, it doesn't seem very radical. But like my presentation, my recent uh, critical creative research about 19th century Indian poet Toru Dutt starts with Wordsworth, but becomes hopefully <laughs> something more interesting. Thank you. Uh, this is Toru. Uh, so born in 1856 in Calcutta, Toru Dutt was the daughter of Govind Chanda Dutt, a former assistant controller general of accounts in the government of India, who resigned citing a lack of opportunities for Indian men and devoted the rest of his life to literary studies as an honorary fellow of Calcutta University. He was a devotee of Wordsworth's poetry and of English education generally, and he was a huge formative influence on Dutt. Uh, making her a poet considered unsettling in more ways than one to contemporary literary scholars. Uh, the conversion of her whole family to Christianity made them effective pariahs in Indian society. And following her brother's death by consumption, from which Dutt herself died at the age of 21, 
Govan took Toru and her sister Aru to Europe in 1869. They lived in Britain and France for four years, receiving an education unprecedented for Indian women at the time, including attending the higher lectures for women at Cambridge University. Dutt is the first Indian woman to have published poetry in English, as well as written a novel in French and translations of French poetry, including Baudelaire, into English. Uh, so pretty prolific. So the second piece I'm going to read is not mine, but Dutt's, Our Kazurina Tree, a poem about a tree in her family's garden house estate in India, which you see pictured here, um, which inserts itself into a Wordsworthian tradition of nature poetry with self-effacing deflection, while also presenting the tree as symbol of both personal memory and pride in India's natural world. So this is our Kazurina tree. Like a huge python winding round and round the rugged trunk, indented deep with scars, up to its very summit near the stars a creeper climbs, in whose embraces bound no other tree could live. But gallantly the giant wears the scarf, and flowers are hung in crimson clusters all the boughs among, whereon all day are gathered bird and bee, and oft at night the gardens overflow with one sweet song that seems to have no close, sung darkling from our tree while men repose. When first my casement is wide open thrown at dawn, my eyes delighted on it rest. Sometimes, and most in winter, on its crest a grey baboon sits statue-like alone watching the sunrise, while on lower boughs his puny offspring leap about and play, and far and near coquilas hail the day, and to their pastures wend our sleepy cows, and in the shadow on the broad tank cast by that hoar tree, so beautiful and vast, the water lilies spring like snow in mass. But not because of its magnificence, dear is the casuarina to my soul. Beneath it we have played, though years may roll, O oh sweet companions loved with love intense, for your sakes shall the tree be ever dear. Blent with your images, it shall arise in memory till the hot tears blind mine eyes. What is that dirge-like murmur that I hear, like the sea breaking on a shingle beach? It is the tree's lament, an eerie speech that haply to the unknown land may reach. Unknown, yet well known to the eye of faith. Ah, I have heard that wail far, far away in distant lands, by many a sheltered bay, when slumbered in his cave the water wraith, and the waves gently kissed the classic shore of France or Italy beneath the moon when earth lay transit in a dream of swoon. And every time the music rose, before mine inner vision rose a form sublime, thy form, O tree, as in my happy prime I saw thee, in my own loved native clime. Next slide, please. Therefore I fain would consecrate a lay unto thy honour tree, beloved of those who now in blessed sleep for I repose. Dearer than life to me, alas, were they. Mayst thou be numbered when my days are done with deathless trees like those in Borrowdale, under whose awful branches lingered pale fear, trembling hope, and death the skeleton, and time the shadow. And though weak the verse that would thy beauty fain, O oh, fain rehearse, may love descend thee from oblivion's curse. Fabienne Moin suggests that most Victorian women's nature poetry of the 19th century was not particularly innovative in terms of meter, rhythm, rhyme, or stylistic devices. And this is true of Dutt's poem on first reading with its iambic pentameter, consistent rhyme scheme, and sentimental content. However, Isabel Armstrong suggests that in writing of this kind, quote, the simpler the surface of the poem, the more likely it is that a second and more difficult poem will exist beneath it. There are too many interesting things, to me at least, about Dutt's poem to fit into this talk. The erudition demonstrated by her references to Wordsworth, Milton, and maybe Shakespeare, the, and the troubling aspects of that literary legacy for an Indian woman. The tree's voice as representative of Dutt's Indian identity, which haunts her when overseas, reminding her of childhood experiences with her now dead siblings. The tree's choking creeper as a potential symbol of the restrictions placed on an Indian woman who was a Christian convert with a European education in a caste society. Her awareness of the ecosystem centering around the Casuarina and her sense of it as integral to the landscape's human operations. I could go on, but it is reading the poem as a response to Wordsworth's poem, You Trees, which interests me most. Um, and here's a little extract in which you may spot some similarities. But worthier still of note are those fraternal four of Borrowdale, joined in one solemn and capacious grove. 
huge trunks, and each particular trunk a growth of intertwisted fibres, serpentine, uncoiling, and inveterately convolved, nor un uninformed with fantasy, and looks that threaten the profane. A pillared shade upon whose grassless floor of red-brown hue by sheddings from the pining umbrage tinged perennially, beneath whose sable roof of boughs as if for festal purpose decked with unrejoicing fairies, ghostly shapes may meet at noontide. Fear and trembling hope, silence and foresight, death the skeleton, and time the shadow. Dutch choice of tree is itself significant when read next to Wordsworth's poem. The casuarina is evergreen, as you saw on the previous slide, with needle foliage, toxic roots, and dark knotted bark, all of which are qualities it shares with the yew tree. The similarities invite a comparison between the trees and by extension between the poems. Um, however, the Casuarina was, at the time, specifically and identifiably non-European. They've since uh, started growing in Italy because they're invasive, uh, but at the time, none in Europe at all. Uh, a tree which does not grow in English soil, and so might be said to operate as a symbol of Dutt's Indian roots. Uh, no pun intended. Uh, even the choice to use the name Casuarina, derived from the Malay word for the cassowary bird, so-called because it resembles the bird's feathers, rather than she-oak, which is the English name for the same tree used since the 18th century, is a statement of hybridity. Dutt uses the power of Wordsworth's poem as a reference point to assert her place in that poetic tradition, while also departing from it in important ways. So the placement and use of Wordsworth's material within Dutt's poem is both an homage and a departure as well. Dutt includes the section about fear and trembling hope in quotation marks, in a deliberate and noticeable allusion to Wordsworth, and yet the quotation cuts and changes um, Wordsworth's line to better fit Dutt's line's metre, a move which appropriates Wordsworth's literary clout to elevate Dutt's poem, but also transforms his work in the name of her own poetic craft, which is a form of literary grafting, I think. And grafting in botany is this process, uh, where two different plants are joined together. One because it is vigorous, uh, the stock, and the other because it has the properties of flowering or giving fruit, the scion. The idea is that when they're carefully cut with a blade called the stylus and placed flush together, healthy examples of even different species with basic similarities can be combined to help them flourish. So a successful grafting is where one plant's resilience is combined with another's potential for flowering. Grafted trees should have some similarities but can be quite different and need to be carefully cut and placed together. When we consider that stylus is also a word for a writing implement, it starts to sound a lot like Dutt's use of Wordsworth's poem. Right, please. Uh, so I found this image which, uh, when I was looking into grafting uh, in Q's online archives, this is uh, an image called The Grafter by Peter Henry Emerson. Um, and what's especially great about this image, I think, is the gender and age dynamics, which work very neatly for my uh, discussion of Dutt and Wordsworth. Um, here, the grafting process operates as a metaphor for legacy despite difference. Um, just as the scion flourishes from the stock, the girl learns the, gra the craft of grafting from an older man and goes on to grow and graft trees of her own. In the case of Dutt and William Wordsworth, the input, metaphorical and literal, of a stock figure leads to the flowering of quite a different poem and poet. Um, I like that as an idea for new modes of literary relation between poets, not the conservative notion of a canon with inheritors, but of poetical grafting leading to the flourishing of new and marginal voices. Um, so this sense of a troubled but productive legacy between Wordsworth and Dutt led me to consider ways in which I might graft words and concepts from both poems to allow for a flowering of something different, a record of a less traditionally notable tree and experience. Um, so the only mem memorable tree from my childhood was this scraggly willow uh, that grew outside my house. I grew up on a council estate in a bleak new town in County Durham called Peter Lee in the mid 1990s. Um, so I tried to look on Street View to see if I could see the tree. Um, and all I got, the closest I got was this blurry lump that you can see there. But uh, I think it is, it is still there. 
Um, <laughs> and half of the circle building you can see was my first house. Um, so my older brother and I sometimes used this tree as a den um, and we hid a lot from racist bullies behind it and in it. Um, it was always full of cigarette ends and garbage. Uh, so quite a departure from either Dutch or Wordsworth's experiences of nature. But uh, though out of place, a tree artificially planted in a bleak town, never thriving, abused by the residents, it was notable, if only to me. Uh, so looking at it from this angle made me think about more metaphorical types of looking down, of how origins like mine are looked down upon. I started to think of it as a metaphor for the restriction and abuse and sense of worthlessness that I experienced as a mixed race person growing up in an impoverished area of a really racist town. Uh, and the ways that more than just trees can grow out of difficult ground. Uh, so I wanted to use the ideas of literary grafting and of humility to make something of this little shit tree from a northern <laughs> council estate to make something of me too, I suppose. So I'll finish by reading the poem, which is called Our Unknown Tree, 42 Christchurch Place, Peterloo. You are not of note. Viewed from above, you look like shit. <laughs> Things tend to like viewed from above. And humbly I submit aerial view crows over television walls, blurs out the ones shoe scraping small but worth a bootlick nevies. My casement stays narrowed on dandelion lawns, fear and trembling hope, what flourished when I slithered, when I took to heel. But from within, no umbrage taken, tab end grit, grey, chuddy paved, your grassless floor is our estate, where we made space, room just enough not to be crushed. Thank you.